Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Usman Khan. Uh, Sheikh Nya was supposed to chair the session, but it seems that he's uh, not yet here. So I will introduce the first speaker, Arman Siddiqui, and when Sheikh comes, he will take over. Arman Siddiqui is a PhD candidate at Harvard Department, at Harvard's Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilization. Her dissertation developed around the life world of a Moroccan scholar, Muhammad Ibn Jafar al Katani, who died in 1927. And it examines religious responses to colonization, pan Islamism, and transnationalism, and other social and intellectual movements of the late 19th and early 20th century. Her broad research and pedagogic pedagogical uh, interest include centering African history within Islamic and Near Eastern studies. Armand has also developed the curriculum for a Muslim children's book company and is uh, currently working on a project to enhance Islamic studies pedagogy in partnership with faculty at Harvard Divinity School. Armand's uh, paper is entitled The Islamic Society for Spiritual Cultivation and Its Tijani Roots. Armand, you have the floor. Assalamu alaikum, um, peace be upon you all. Thank you so much, Professor Khan, for convening uh, this wonderful conference um, and for inviting me to participate. I am very honored uh, to be in such esteemed company and to present in particular uh, on this project, which from my end um, is just a very humble effort to capture um, a bit of the incredible work uh, that the Khan family has been doing in our community for the past several years. So in this paper, I discuss the Islamic Society for Spiritual Cultivation, henceforth ISSC, an organization founded by Harvard University Professor of Islamic and African Studies, Dr. Usman Khan, and a group of his graduate students to address the challenges faced by practicing Muslims studying Islam in secular academic institutions in Boston uh, and Greater New England. Since 2018, the organization has institutionalized itself by obtaining nonprofit status, partnering with Harvard Divinity School to host an annual academic conference and Molith concert, and electing an official committee that oversees all operations of the ISSC from educational programming and funding to interfaith outreach and prison education. By creating a nurturing environment in which students and their families can simultaneously grow spiritually and intellectually, all the while serving and uh, building and serving community, the ISSC aspires to empower its members with a holistic understanding of the faith and an opportunity to engage it in ways that are limited in secular settings. In examining the programming of the ISSC, which is firmly rooted in the Nicene branch of the Tijani Tariqa, I also illuminate the potential of Sufism to serve not merely as object of study within the academy, but also as a pedagogical tool for active and experiential learning about Islam. The ISSC's socio-religious basis in the distinctly West African tradition of Sufism and the accompanying cultural immersion provides ISCC members also actively works to center a region that is often provincialized in Islamic and Near Eastern studies and universities. Um, so to discuss the history and context a little, the ISSC first began as a safe space for Muslim students struggling to find a community of like-minded seekers upon first moving to Boston from around the world to begin their studies. What started as an intimate vicar circle in the home of Dr. Khan in 2014 with several of his students from Harvard and MIT and their families has now become a weekly fixture in the broader community attracting dozens of committed members every Friday where students, faculty, chaplains, artists, visiting imams and even diplomats um, have presented academic papers, recited devotional poetry or given short talks after vicar. While participants form a rather eclectic body uh, of the, the organization, the ISSC has from its inception always grounded itself in the distinct path of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, the legacy and sacred chain of transmission for which Dr. Khan and his family are direct inheritors. The worldwide community of Sheikh Nias's disciples, as, as we all know here, uh, is known as the Jamaat al Faida, the community of the divine flood. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the really rich etymological significance of Faida within Tijani and broader Sufi discourse. Um, and we'll simply reference um, that iconic moment uh, in 1929, when Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, then a young Tijani disciple himself, had a transformative mystical experience, which would subsequently earn him the title of Sahib al-Faida, bringer of the flood, and lead to him founding a new branch of the Jamaat al-Faida, 
centered around his novel outlook towards Serbia, spiritual cultivation. During Sheikh Niyas's own lifetime, the Tijaniya swept rapidly across the region, reaching millions of Muslims in more than 15 African countries south of the Sahara. Today, as this conference makes manifest, the Tijani Tariqa has proliferated well beyond the African continent, commanding a remarkable global following. And this brings us back to the, the context of Boston, where the ISSC effectively operates today as a formal branch of the FEDA, given the Khan family's personal connection to and leadership position within it. The ISSC's focal gathering point is its Friday Dhikr and Halakha, known in wider Tijani circles as the Hadrat al Jama. The sequence of activities at this weekly gathering closely mirrors the standard programming of Tijani gatherings worldwide. The group convenes one hour before sunset, so the Friday specific litanies and devotional acts can be completed up until the time for Maghrib prayer. After praying in congregation, a short talk is given. This is the halakha portion of, of the evening, followed by a communal meal and socializing. The image of Feda uh, as flood uh, is an apt metaphor for the experience of dhikr at the ISSC. On any given Friday night at the Khan family residence, the outpouring is palpably felt. The crowd swells as the night progresses, bodies often spilling into hallways and adjacent rooms, and the Hailala reverberates the air around the entire premises until the Maghrib Adhan is called. The Feda is a movement to expand and emanate divine grace also undergirds the philosophy and long-term vision of the ISSC, which is to proliferate informed knowledge of Islam in secular settings, especially institutions of higher education. It achieves this through a bottom-up process-oriented approach. First, to inculcate the practice of spiritual cultivation in ISSC members' private lives, which then enriches their knowledge of Islam and ultimately inspires them to contribute rigorous scholarship of their own, informed by the ISSC's holistic method of integrating religious text, theory, and practice. This religious education works to also instill a commitment to serve society, a direct application of Islamic ethics, and of Tijani ethos in particular. Within at least one year of completing this uh, integrated Islamic studies program, um, if you will, alongside academic and professional work on Islam, the organization aspires to have cultivated careful Muslim scholars and chaplains who cater to both the university settings and their wider communities. I'll now briefly elaborate on the three core pillars of this program with an eye towards understanding how the FEDA underpins and guides its practice. And these pillars are one, spiritual cultivation, tarbiya, two, religious and cultural education, and three, social justice. So um, section on tarbiya. The spiritual experience of consistently engaging in a devotional exercise like group dhikr and belonging to a community forms the broadest underlying base in terms of what draws all individuals to the ISSC. Regardless of their various vocations, members of the group collectively desire to cultivate deeper faith and a more intimate relationship with God and the Prophet Muhammad. The ISSC embraces these individuals with open arms by providing a structured method of obtaining their spiritual goals. Indeed, at the heart of Tijani and of broader Sufi practice is Tarbiya, the spiritual training that an aspiring to the path undergoes for the, the ultimate purpose of achieving marifa or experiential knowledge of God. The cornerstone of this training is receiving a litany, a word from Dr. Khan or another muqaddim, which specifies the sequence and frequency of uttering repentance, istighfar, prayers upon the prophet, salawat, and affirmations of God's unicity, hailala, that are to be recited daily. In addition to steadfastly reciting the daily word, the primary pathway for progressing on the spiritual path towards achieving marifa is emulation of the prophet Muhammad sallam, in ideally all aspects of one's life. In this sense, knowing the Prophet Muhammad so as to emulate his immaculate character serves as a precondition for unlocking the human potential to know and experience God. Yet crucially, emulation of the Prophet also entails following and acting upon his legal and theological knowledge. As such, the spiritual exercises of the ISSC strictly do not replace the foundational tenets of Islam and the obligatory acts of worship that are incumbent upon Muslims. Rather, Spiritual cultivation serves to profoundly deepen and enhance the aspirant's religious foundation and reveal higher levels of knowledge. For a number of ISSC participants, this distinction is important. The ISSC offers an alternative to new age Sufi groups that also promise mystical experiences to their adherents but may not operate from an Islamic legal and theological basis. In the Tijani path, the acquisition of the outer and inward sciences go hand in hand. 
As a spiritual method, tarbiyah is flexible and tailored to an individual's unique disposition. Dr. Khan explains this in the context of commenting on the diverse participant body of the ISSC, a number of whom do not officially identify as Sijani disciples. Participation in the tariqa, he maintains, is comprised of multiple levels of commitment. Those who participate occasionally in the devotional gatherings without formal initiation into the tariqa, those who are initiated into the tariqa and only recite the obligatory litany described above, the rirad lazima, and those who take the optional litany of tarbiyah, which accelerates uh, the process of obtaining marifa. Those who take the weird lazima do so as a means to purify their soul, a process which will eventually lead to marifa at some point before their death. Although initiation into the order via obtaining a weird is not required of all participants, there is benefit in formally entering the tariqa in that it would inspire the individual to commit to reciting istighfar, salawat, and hailala regularly for the duration of their life. The benefit, benefit of this, Dr. Khan continues to explain, is mentioned in the, in the following hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, the best deeds, quote, the best deeds are those done regularly, even if there are few, end quote. Formal affiliation through an authorized chain of transmission is also advantageous in that it connects the aspirant to every master in the chain, leading up the Sheikh Tijani, who then provides the aspirant with spiritual assistance or madad. Despite these spiritual benefits of formally joining the tariqa, Dr. Khan maintains that this is not a condition to accept members into the ISSC. All steps taken towards spiritual cultivation have merit for even paths of engagement in devotional activities on one day may activate a desire to connect on a deeper level later, depending on the individual uh, journey um, of each um, uh, aspirant on the path. While local non-university affiliated Tijani disciples of West African descent do form a particular subgroup within the ISSC, there's no tension between them and other initiated disciples with non-disciples as the specifics around an individual's level of commitment is not overtly discussed. On the contrary, this diversity is itself a draw for many members of the ISSC who may have been disillusioned with certain dynamics at play in, their community, in other Muslim communities. Regardless of affiliation and level of initiation, what is certain is that all members of the ISSC get a visceral taste, dhok, of spiritual inspiration, which brings them back time and again. Dr. Khan has referred to this philosophy as democratizing the sacred, a hallmark of Sheikh Niaz's outlook on tarbiya, which was extended to everyone. To quote, to quote Rudiger Suzman, he let the cup make its round among all those who desired it, and he bestowed the secret on everyone who underwent the training. The second pillar of the ISSC is religious education. Closely connected to the goal of transmitting tarbiya is the ISSC's commitment to general religious education, especially for graduate students of Islamic studies. As mentioned earlier, this pillar of the program was born out of specific challenges voiced by members concerning the lack of balanced training on Islam offered at the university, where students and professionals feel forced to choose between engaging with secular education about Islam and religious education itself. This is a common concern among students of religious studies at Western academic institutions, which tend to favor Eurocentric theories of religion at the expense of overshadowing the rich and varied traditions of empirical knowledge in other cultures. The ISSC maintains that not only does this curtail Muslim students' own spiritual growth, but that it also pre presents an incomplete portrait of Islam to students in general. The depth and multiplicity of Islamic epistemology is eclipsed. This is precisely the void that the ISSC aims to fill by giving university students the opportunity to study Islamic spirituality firsthand through guided in-depth study of primary texts and accompanying devotional practices that doubly focus on developing moral character and academic prowess, processes that have been separated in the modern Western Academy. In addition to this program, that is the reading of primary texts in tandem with devotional activities, there are two other important features of the ISSC's curriculum that I wish to briefly highlight. Um, the first is centering Africa. Um, in 2016, the ISSC inaugurated the Islam in Africa lecture series in partnership with Harvard, U Harvard University, which brings local and international scholars and students together to critically reflect on the question of how Islam has benefited from religious and cultural exchanges with Africa. This program is part of a broader culture at the ISSC, which aspires to highlight the significant contributions of African Muslims to the tapestry of Islamic social, spiritual, and intellectual history, a fact that has often been downplayed or outright ignored in standard courses of, on Islam and religion in Near Eastern Studies departments. 
Most recently, for example, the organization hosted visiting scholars, Ria Rahman, Caitlin Bolton, and Joseph Hill for presentations as varied as Islamic humanitarianism in South Africa, Madrasa education in Zanzibar, and women Tijani Sufi leaders in Senegal. Other scholars who have presented research on the Tijani Tariqa and Sufi devotional poetry situated in Africa and beyond include Zachary Wright, Nooludamani Ogoneke. Um, in addition to these exchanges at the university level, one of the organization's long-term visions is to build meaningful connections between the ISSC community in Boston and the Tijani networks um, across North and West Africa. And to that end, the ISSC currently hosts a two-week educational retreat to visit centers of secret learning in Morocco and Senegal. This field education provides a crucial bridge between cultures and reinforces the ISSC's philosophy that the study of religion is deeply rooted in both sacred text and lived experience. Um, the second aspect of its religious studies program um, is fostering global connections. So while the ISSC's deep-seated spiritual and intellectual connections to Africa remain paramount, the organization also actively seeks to connect its community in Boston to the global Muslim Ummah generally, which includes networking with other Sufi Turuk. Um, in 2015, for example, the ISSC hosted Suleiman Chishti, custodian of the shrine of Moedin Chishti, the great 13th century Indian mystic. Other impressive foreign leaders who have delivered lectures and led halakas at the ISSC include Qibla Ayaz, president of the Council of Islamic Ideology in Pakistan, Rashid Umar, Imam of Claremont uh, Masjid in Cape Town, Muhammad Ashafa, Imam and interfaith leader in Nigeria, Babakar Niang, Dean of Al-Janija Institute in Senegal, and Ali Nias, advisor at the Senegalese Consulate in Morocco. The ISSC has also hosted Sufi concerts featuring internationally acclaimed artists such as the Baraka Boys and Senegalese singer Umar Niang. The inclusion of Sufi poetry and performance alongside academic lectures also serves an important pedagogical end, which is to introduce ISCC students to the field of Islamic aesthetics and the pathways to experiential knowledge that it presents. So to recapitulate this section, the ISSC has developed a religious and cultural education program for its students of Islamic studies, a foundational tenet of which is the application of Islamic principles of spirituality to rigorous academic scholarship in the secular academy. It works towards the school by hosting lectures and performances which go hand in hand with the organization's practices of tarbiyah. While the program's curriculum covers the Islamic tradition at large, the Tijani order gives concrete form and structure to the ISSC's devotional activities and its discourses on the Sawa. The third pillar of the ISSC's overarching Islamic studies program is the extension of spiritual tarbiyah into the sphere of social justice and service to others, and Sufi or, or kind of spiritual parlance khidma. The ISSC underscores the symbiotic relationship between individual spiritual growth and society, society's betterment. The strong community ethos within the Tariqa can be traced to the genesis of the Jamaat al Faida as both a religious and social movement. Sheikh Ahmed Tijani drew a direct parallel between Muslims' inward spiritual states and the state of the Muslim Ummah during their times. This approach to Tarbiya, which connects self to society and vice versa, is an epistemological framework that is present in Muslim societies throughout the world. The premise assumes a very basic correlation, that the more ethically upright one's character becomes in the Tijani context, the more one emulates the Prophet Muhammad, then the more that individual will feel compelled to address social ills and injustice in their communities. This mindset can also be connected to the Islamic legal and ethical concept of hizba, that is the Quranic imperative to publicly enjoin the good and forbid the wrong in society. Adherence to Hizba produces an ethical political environment of both individual and collective accountability, which then protects society from moral and political corruption. In the specifically Sufi context, the ISSC's approach to Tarbiya also exemplifies a broader phenomena of uh, engaged uh, Sufism or spiritual activism, an area of research that underscores the fact that Sufism by its very definition offers key tools for cultivating ethically informed engagement with society, given the organic relationship between personal and public ethics that it cultivates. At the ISSC, this is fostered by the organization's involvement in various projects, such as maintaining a food pantry for disadvantaged students and community members, providing spiritual support and training for prison chaplaincy and education, and hosting a Ramadan food drive in which iftar meals are dropped off to students struggling with the dual challenges of financial insecurity and social isolation during the current pandemic. In her fascinating field research on a Tijani branch <clears throat> in Cape Town, Susanna Literes argues that Tarbiya and the Tijani Tariqa profoundly influences the social behavior of its members, 
uh, to actively work towards social cohesion by challenging racism, empowering members' African identities, and integrating Black Muslims from segregated townships into the wider community. In so doing, the theorist argues that Tijani Tariqa is a living, breathing embodiment of the essence of Islam, which is without nationalistic or racial distinction. At the ISSC, lectures by two prison chaplains, Taymullah Abdurrahman and Al Walid Muhammad, on prison education echoed these very sentiments. Indeed, the issue of racial justice is a theme that remains at the heart of and center of this tariqa wherever it takes root, um, as Rasul Miller and Samia Rahman, um, Rahman's research uh, compellingly illustrates. Um, and I want to end this section by quoting uh, one of the ISSC's very dear um, and, and very senior members, Haja Ashaki Tahasi Se, who prior to moving to Boston was a pioneering member of the early Tijani community of New York in the 1970s, um, as Rasul Miller's um, research um, beautifully captures. In a stirring essay, Haja Ashaki reflects on the profound impact her sheikh had on healing the Black American Muslim community, spiritually and psychologically. Sheikh Hassan Sise, she says, courageously and steadfastly worked night and day to heal the hearts of indigenous American Muslims, showing us the way to obtain Allah's forgiveness and redirecting us from a path of destruction to the path of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Alhamdulillah, end quote. Through its interconnected channels of spiritual awakening, intellectual growth, community building and social activism, the ISSC leads its participants towards experiencing divine grace in both their private lives and their public livelihoods. Given the particular context in which so many of the Tariqa's participants flock to it, this experience is flit fittingly illustrated as a flood of relief. Um, and I'll just briefly conclude by recapitulating. Um, this paper has introduced the Islamic Society for Spiritual Cultivation, a Boston-based organization that draws on the paradigm of Sheikh Ibrahim Niyaz's Feda Tijaniya to provide its participants with spiritual growth, religious and cultural education, and opportunities for engaged social and political action. This dynamic three-pronged approach to tasawwuf as simultaneously spiritual, intellectual, and social cultivation provides an opportunity for the ISSC participants to live Sufism firsthand, a crucial addendum to their Islamic studies education at secular academic institutions that are generally ill-equipped to impart experiential knowledge to students for a host of reasons. Members of the ISSC typically meet on a weekly basis, hosted at the Khan family residence and now virtually, for the duration of a full academic year. In addition to bridging the deepening disconnect between studying Islam and the secular academy versus traditional spaces of sacred learning, the success of this program thus far also has implications for the function of Sufism in the Western Academy as a powerful pedagogical tool for engaged teaching and learning about Islam. And that's the end. Thank you very much, uh, Arman, for uh... Excellent presentation of the ISCC, the first paper written on the uh, foundation. Now the next speaker, I believe, is Sheikh Ahmed Bukhar Nyang. Sheikh Ahmed Bukhar was born in Medina by Kaulak, Senegal, to a family of Islamic scholars. He, he simultaneously received Quranic and high Islamic studies at home and primary and secondary education in public schools in French. After graduating from high school, he attended the University of Reims, champagne ardennes where he received a bachelor's degree in law. He subsequently received a master's degree in international law at the University of Paris in Sergi Pontoise and a postgraduate degree in human rights and humanitarian law at the School of Law at Nanterre University. He has devoted the last 20 years of his life documenting the biography of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias and translating uh, his poetry. Among his many uh, publications are Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, L'Homme du Monde, Ou au Monde, Volume 1 and 2, and a translation of Sayyid uh, al-Qalb in French, but also in English. So without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Sheikh Ibrahim, reminding you that this is uh, uh, the panel uh, the fight, the global fight, the global spread of the fighter, too. So, Sheikh Bukhar, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for this. Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, praise and upon the apostle of God. I agree and thank the organizers of this August event and all participants, especially the esteemed professor Usman Khan. 
Prince Alwarid bin Talal, Professor of Contemporary Islamic Religion and Society and Professor of African American Studies. This event holds at a time of a great uncertainty when the world, more than anything, needs some sort of anchor and clarity. So I believe that such a program is part of that drive to certainty and clarity, making it of utmost importance. I have been assigned to speak uh, on Tijani festivals in Europe as part of the panel on the global spread of the feather. It is itself a big theme which can't, can't be exhausted by this presentation alone, since the growth of the communities of FIDA keep increasing and spreading out into regions and territories. This, however, is a glad tiding as the title of the panel speaks of the fulfilled prophecy of Sheikh Ibrahim Yes that the FIDA will reach the horizons by Allah's will. We all know the importance of uh, congregational acts of worship in Islam. Prophet Muhammad said, the prayer of a man in congregation is 25 times greater than the prayer in his home or shop. The hadith could be found in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari uh, 620 or Sahih Muslim 649. This hadith highlights the importance of praying in congregation or praying individually. Such act leads beside the cultural meaning to strengthen the bonds of brotherhood between the ummah, the community. At the end of each week, there is a holy festival called the Juma or Friday prayer. It is made of a khutbah or sermon by the Imam and two units of prayer. Likewise, the Hajj is an example of the great importance of congregation in Islam. In summary, Shah Ibrahim said that said, during a Maulid speech in 1968, that at the completion of every act of worship, there is a holy festival as a way of giving thanks to Allah for guiding us to the right path. But according to him, the most important of all festivals is so obvious to the intellectual that it doesn't need an explicit phrasing in the Quran or Hadith, meaning the celebration of the Prophet's birthday. He used the following example to illustrate a keen point. How could it be reasonable to find physical proofs for daytime? The importance of such an event, daytime, is so obvious that it needs no, no explicit divine injunction upon the Muslim community to celebrate it. Yet there are several verses that make its celebration celebration of the Prophet's birthday, Prophet's birth, more than obligatory, according to Sheikh Ibrahim. In Surah to Yunus, uh, verse 58, Allah says, In the bounty of Allah and his mercy, in that let them rejoice, that is better than the wealth they hold. The bounty of Allah and his mercy being the Prophet Muhammad as Allah says in the book, I have not sent to thee, but as a mercy to mankind. In another verse, uh, Surah Hud, verse 120, Allah says, all that we relate you to, all that we relate to thee of the stories of the messengers, with it we make firm thy heart. And so in Surah Nisa, Nisa, verse 64, Allah says, if whenever they wrong themselves, they had come to you praying to Allah for, for forgiveness and had the messenger prayed for their forgiveness, they would indeed have found Allah all forgiving, all compassionate. This is the proof of the, of the legitimacy of celebrating the Prophet's birth according to Sheikh Ibrahim. According to Sheikh Ibrahim, moreover, Maulid celebration is greater than the night of power. For this great night, greater than thousand, thousand months, would have remained unknown had the prophet not been ordained and sent as mercy to the whole creation. So to NBI verse 107. And this is why there is no specific day to rejoice or rehearse the prophet's life story and show gratefulness to the Lord, the most high for his birth and the fulfillment of his mission. Being the harbinger of mercy in the bridge between heaven and earth, he remains the eternal archetype of the symbiotic relationship between divine mercy and the cosmic manifestation of all that is was and ever will be. To celebrate him then is to celebrate mercy of the divine gaze in the fullness of and promise thereof. The divine gaze in the fullness and promise thereof. And to celebrate the mercy of God is a never ending event. Themes such as these are replete in Muslim piety and love of the apostle of God. I will say a few words about the importance of prophet in Tijani Brotherhood. We all know that praise or Madi poetry Praise poetry is very important and popular among the Sufis. These are profound and devotional odes to the prophet in praise and celebration of his greatness 
as established foremost by revealed tradition above all things, and then holy inspiration that descends upon the heart of the illuminated sage, sages and servants of earlier and later, 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 later days. In his book, Poetry in, in Praise of Prophetic Perfection, a study of West African Arabic Madih poetry and its precedence, Dr. Oludamini Ugunaiki wrote, the region's most popular Arabic language poet in recent times, Sheikh Ibrahim Yes, also the founder of the largest Sufi movement in the region, Faida Tijaniya, published over a dozen collections of poetry consisting almost entirely of praises of the prophet. Several of his poems are devoted to the praise of the founder of his order, Ahmed Tijani, but even these poems connect most of the praises of Atijani to with to those with the prophet. The author emphasizes on the poetry of Sheikh Ibrahim Yas, which in addition to being among us, the greatest of this tradition, synthesizing most of, much of what has been written before it is currently the most popular and influential in the region. The figure of the prophet is at the center of all Muhammadan spiritual orders, particularly uh, the, the Tijani. Now, Tijani in Europe, taking roots in North, in North Africa, the Tijani Sufi path was born in Algeria and later spread on to the rest of the world. Today, there are tens of millions of people who identify themselves as Tijani. The Tijani probably spread uh, through Europe in the beginning of the 1900s, in Eastern Europe, precisely in the Balkans, where prominent Tijani personalities have lived, such as the scholar Sheikh Muhammad Shaban Effendi Dom, Dom, Dom Nori, who was said to have been among the first to introduce the Tariqa, and also the Mufti Hafiz Sabri Bushati, Sheikh Qazim Hoja, and most recently Hafiz Sabri Koshi, the Grand Mufti of Albania, who passed away in 2004. By means of the pilgrimage to Mecca, the Tijani path made its way spreading to the Albanian provinces of the Ottoman Empire between 900 and 910, and, or even later around 918. The scholar Sheikh Muhammad Shaban Effendi Domnori is said to have met during the Hajj, the well-known Tijani Shuyu, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Minhaji, and Sheikh Alfa Hashim al Futi, a parent who is related to Sheikh Amr al Futi. Uh, Sheikh Domnori was appointed Muqaddam by them and came back to Albania where he worked to, to disseminate the tariqa until his passing away in uh, 1934. The proliferation the the of the Tijania in other parts of Europe was carried out by the Africans in the in diaspora. From its advance to its quick spread to the four corners of the world as predicted by its founder, the Tijani flood, the Tijani Faida of Sheikh Ibrahim reinforced the practice of Maulid celebration globally. Moreover, as Sheikh Ibrahim said, endorsing the words of one of his daughters who spoke, as he emphasized on the divine inspiration, there is no specific day to celebrate the birth of the bridegroom of the universe. For it is through him that mankind has received its two main favors, the favor of existence and that of survival, both material and spiritual. I would like to say a few words now about the importance of Maori celebration in the fighter community. You know, Sheikh, Sheikh Ahmad Tijani predicted as related by Sittayib Sufiani in his book, Al Ifad al Ahmadiyya, a fighter will come, will come forth among my companions until people enter our path in successive droves. Sheikh Ahmad Tijani said, as related by Sittayib Ahmad, uh, Sid Tayyip, uh, Sufiani, fighter means flood of grace and is in channeling divine gnosis to all and sundry. It was predicted by the founder of the order, Ahmad Tijani, and as it appeared in the exegesis of Nazifi, uh, the proof of the facts lay in facilitation of arrival to the divine presence. Sheikh Ibrahim claimed to be the founder of such a lofty path in 929, the number of his followers around the world and the contribution of his school of thought in the field of experiential knowledge culminated in strengthening in the strengthening of such status. His spokesperson in Kanu Malam Tijani Osman wrote in his collection of poetry, Mirwaq al-Ushaq, if, if it took centuries for any other saint to rise to fame, his father, its effulgence reached the whole universe in the shortest notice. Sheikh Ibrahim was a prolific writer. Most of his writings constitute of, constitutes of poetry dedicated to his beloved, uh, the Prophet Muhammad. Dr. Andrea Brigaglia wrote that uh, in his uh, the article entitled Learning, Gnosis and Exorcism, Public Tafsir and Sufi Revival in the City of Kano, uh, that, below, uh, that uh, Malam Tijan Osman, whom I cited, belonged to the first group of Kano scholars that traveled to Kano to Kaulak, Senegal, to undergo training at the hands of Sheikh Ibrahim. Upon his return, he started to organize annual public activities, night gatherings based on dik and reading of poetry during the month of Rabi al-Awwal, the month of the birth, Prophet's birthday. This citation proves the emphasis made by the Fayda Tijaniya on the importance of celebrating the birth of Prophet Muhammad uh, um, 
the novelty of such event lays in reading uh, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim's panegyrics upon Prophet Muhammad, uh, alongside the poems written by uh, Ahmad Sidi Busayri, Imam, Imam Busayri. Uh, uh, we found uh, a, hand, a manuscript uh, of Sheikh Ahmad Tiani, handwriting of Sheikh Ahmad Tiani, where he copied uh, the Hamzia and the, Busayri, the, the Buddha of Imam Busayri and the authentication of Sheikh Ahmad Sukirji that these writings is those of Sheikh Ahmad Tiani. I have appended those documents in, uh, uh, with, with this panel. Um, this document was handed over to me by the son of Sheikh Hassan, Sheikh Alaudin. Uh, Sheikh Ibrahim wrote in Jabal al-Kasr, the uh, healing of the fracture, that whoever spends something in the celebration of the chosen one as a way of honoring the best, of, the best one who ever lived sh shall be counted among those who supported his cause. Also in Jabrukas, the same D1, same collection of poetry, he says, in celebrating his birth, I hope to gain spiritual opening, to sip in the water of his secret, but to drink it at once. In celebrating his birth, I hope to gain all good that I become the shining sun of my contemporaries. He also wrote, in celebrating the birth of the guide and giver of glad tidings, I have surpassed the old and the younger ones, despite the grudge of the antagonist or the excessive envious ones. It is through its celebration that I yearn to own the hearts of the polytheists without uttering no lie or mongering any delusional way. It is through it that I long to become the Paul of this century, the sovereign of all those who praise him in poetry, in direct emulation of the past great poets and inspirators. Honor his birth, O oh beloved, honor it. Him who refrains from that has surely disrespected him. I will uh, go quickly to speak about the Tiani Festival in Western Europe. 99% uh, of the Friday Tiani Festival uh, are dedicated to the celebration of the birth of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and even Sheikh Ibrahim, uh, among the most, the book, most studied book during these festivals is the, the, the Nurul Basar, the Matthi Sayyid al-Bashar, the clay eyesight on praising the master of mankind, which is a summary of the Prophet's life history, beginning from his birth to his death and then ending with the seeking of intercession by, by Sheikh Ibrahim uh, uh, on, from the Prophet, from his companions and his close relatives. Uh, uh, now I will start speaking about the Tiani uh, festival in Europe, stricto sensu, beginning by, 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 by the United Kingdom. The first greatest Maulid festival graced by an World, world renowned Tijani leader was that of uh, November 1987. The grandson of Sheikh Ibrahim, Sheikh Imam Hassan Sisi, was invited by Shamsuddin al Farsi, the leader of the uh, Sufi High Council. According to documents attached to this study, it gathered more than 50,000, according to the, to the Scotland Yard, but according to the organizers, more than 120,000 people were gathered, marched peacefully to Hyde Park to listen to speeches of the uh, the organizers. Uh, let us explore quickly the location of the new T UK Tijani community within this context and to speak about the Zawi of uh, British born uh, Faida disciples in 2009, a year after the demise of Sheikh Hassan Sisi, his brother, the new Imam Sheikh Ahmad Tijani Sisi, was invited to London by an organization called the Radical Way, founded by the late Dr. Fuad Nahdi. And after these, uh, it, uh, it was the, the starting point where uh, Humaira Khan, wife of Nahdi, Rakin, Fatuga, uh, Sayyida Sukina Douglas, and her husband took Tijani afterward from uh, Tijani Ben Omar, and, uh, and then they renewed their, they renewed their, their allegiance from uh, Sayyida Sukina from Sheikh Mahdi Ali Sisi, who gave him the ijaza. She is now a full muqaddama in the tariqa. And Rakin is also a muqaddam in the tariqa who, adhere, who pledged allegiance to Imam Sheikh Tijani, Sheikh Tijani Ali Sisi. Uh, the community outgrew in um, the house of Rakin. And in 2017, uh, in 2014, they, they held their first, uh, in January, they, they held their first Maulid Nabi. In 2017, Mustafa Briggs is also a muqaddam. 
organized a modest event called Welcome, Welcoming Rabin Awal. In 2018, he organized, he had the idea to collaborate with Sayyidina Sukina Douglas, I did earlier, and Muhammad Yahya, her husband, to organize a Maulid at Rumi's cave, geared towards a younger generation with performances by popular Nasheed artists. In 2019, the community organized Fragrance of the Beloved, Maulid with talks by Sheikh Ibrahim Khalil, grandson of Sheikh Ibrahim, who's living in Lutin, in the United Kingdom. Sheikh Khalid Sharif from Medina Munawwara, Zik and Muqaddam by Muqaddam uh, ha Abdul Hafiz from Nigeria, poetry from Sukina Douglas and Nurqaya Fetuga, the daughter of Muqaddam Raqqi. In 2020, you welcome Rabi. I will now give the list of the organizations, Nigerian and Ghanaian organizations. We have a Zawiya in North London called Zumunta, uh, Zumunta Zawiya. Uh, which organized the uh, Marut celebration every year. But the first Marut from the Nigerian community was organized in, in 1994 by the Ichhad al Tijaniya. And then Jamia to Lutfullahi, based in the UK, the Darul Kitab al Hikmah is based in Dagenham, the, Z uh, the Zawiya Uswat is based in London, the, in Luton is, is the base, Luton is the base of Darul Kitab al Hikmah, Fayda Tijani organization led by Sheikh Ibrahim Khalid Nias, which was created right, in 2009. The Tijani Ibrahim Association of Nigeria is based in Liverpool, the Tijani Ibrahim Association of Nigeria in Ireland, the Tijani Youth Movement is based in Birmingham, founded by Sheikh Fatihi, son of Sheikh Salih Shaban, who was companion of Sheikh Ibrahim. The Zawi Ahbab Sheikh Al Awaliya is based in Birmingham, founded by Muqaddam Tawfiq by Madawati. And they all have in common the celebration of the birth of Prophet Muhammad. Now, about the Friday Tijani Festival organized by Senegambian organization. The Jamiat Ansar Dean of London, founded in 1997, which is led by Sheikh Ibrahim Jam. They organize yearly uh, Maulid celebration. In Manchester, the Abna al Faida Association, founded in 2003. Uh, al Faida al Fitian Federation, uh, of uh, Birmingham, Ansar Dean of Scotland, the Ansar Dean Association, based in London. Ansar al Faida Association is based in London. The Diet of Udam al Faida of Crowley, uh, they, they all. Uh, called Tijani uh, Maulid festivals yearly. In Belgium, we have the Tijani Fida organization, founded in 2010 and is based in Brussels. Their first organization was held on November 15th, 2014 at Sheraton Hotel under the topic Sufism in Islam by Sheikh Said Ali Nias. Yes, the event was held in a conference format. In Italy, the biggest Friday Tijani festivals are the ones organized in Italy. It is hosted by the Ansar Uddin Federation founded in the late 90s. The programs are usually month long, starting with big Maulid celebration and then followed by conferences all around the country from 2001 to 2014. 30 conferences were hosted with the late Professor Ibrahim Mahmoud Diop, uh, who is now, now the guest speaker after his demise in Sheikh Sidi Ali. Yes, in 2005, year of the caricatures of Prophet by a Danish artist, he chose the topic on the true physical, of the true physical and moral portrait of the Prophet. His, the last topic he addressed in 2014 was the inimitability of the Holy Quran in response to a book written by the late Senegalese scholar, Professor Sankar. In Spain, the federation, we have a whole federation of organizations, which gathered, is composed by 16 associations from Gisona, Lerida, Terrassa, to Fangerola, Malaga, Granada, Tenerife, mostly of Senegalese origin. origin. They have been organizing Maulid celebration with the, with the late Professor Ibrahim Mahmoud Diop as the guest speaker. After the latter's demise, Sheikh Mahi Ali Sisi was appointed by the late Khalifa Sheikh Ahmed Tijani to replace him. Now, the Friday Tijani in France, before concluding, uh, the first Muqaddam in France was Alaji Adjumasin. He was appointed Muqaddam in 1973. You remember Sheikh Ibrahim has visited France several times. And in UK, his first Muqaddam was uh, the UK, uh, the, the Nigerian High Commissioner Sheikh Abdul Malik Abdul Members of the Sedo community, originating from the uh, no, north of Senegal, uh, were the first one to organize Maulid festival uh, at the end of the 80s. However, the first major festival was celebrated in 2001. In 2003, uh, the Fulbe organized in Mantla uh, a great Maulid festival, which was, uh, uh, as guest speaker, they had Sheikh Abdullah Jaw of Burghi and Sheikh Muhammad Al Amin, son of Sheikh Ibrahim. Yes. The France Federation gathered 25 organizations scattered in the whole, in the whole country. And since the, the creation of the legal body in 2008, they have organized 10 Maulid festivals and six conferences. 
Uh, we, in Germany also, we have several associations, uh, the Fed Association from uh, Nigerian, formed by Nigerian, Togolese, Ghanaian, and Senegalese and Gambians. The biggest ones are the Tijania Brotherhood in Hanover, uh, led by Sheikh Abu Bakr Bok, and the Ansar al organization led by uh, Sheikh Al-Haji Fatih. To conclude, in conclusion, we see the pervasive importance of the Maulid as the cornerstone of Tijani piety and methodic praxis. At the heart of the Tijani doctrine is the direct and intense Mohammedan presence who remains for Tijanis the main founder and spiritual nourisher of the order. To be a Tijani is to be the one who loves, follows, and celebrates the Prophet Muhammad in both words and deeds. In pursuit of this goal, the Maulid becomes a major thematic arena in the development of that Muhammadi consciousness in the heart of the disciple. Hence, the year-round celebrations and festivals and recitation of the prophetic biography and lifestyle is being held. The advent of the fighter within this milieu of love and celebration of the prophetic man only intensifies the practice and sharpens the many ways it flows into the spiritual and social elevations, elevation of its followers and admirers. Through it, we see floods of Maulids in Europe, much like its global proliferation in earlier times, carrying with it the promise of gnosis and experiential knowledge. Today, it keeps that promise alive and also brings along multitudes in communion with the beloved of God, which is at once a prophecy fulfilled and a verification of the truthfulness of its bearer, Sheikh Ibrahim Yes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I'm pleased to. I'm pleased to take over the chairmanship of this panel. I would like to congratulate Sheikh Ahmed Bukhar Nyang for his magnificent communication on Tijania festivals. I take this opportunity to congratulate the previous speaker, Arman Sitir, who will speak on the following topic. Mohamed Milanzi was born in Timbiza, south, in South Africa. He is a half of Quran, one who has memorized the entire scripture. He holds a BSc degree in computer science for the University of Cape Town. He also holds a number of ijaza in the science of Sharia and Tasawwuf from a variety of illustrate mashayikh, including Sheikh Ibrahim Haber from Mauritania, Sheikh Mohamedul Mahi from Senegal, Muhammad Shoaib Ahmad from South Africa, and Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Shakur Al Mayadini from Jordan. He has also attended several illustrious Madaris traditional schools and has given lecture on variety of Islamic topics to various conferences and gatherings. Islamic community development is Muhammad's driving passion and the current serves as Imam of the Falak Islamic community in that part in South, in South Africa, where he runs a variety of spiritual, educational and outreach activities. He is a Muqaddam authorized representative of the Tariqa Tijania and served as the president of the Gautam Fida Tijania in which capacity he leads Dikh invocation cycle of behalf of Sheikh Haibah. Muhammad served as deputy president of the Muhammad Sikh Foundation of African Ulemas in South Africa, which strive to revive traditional Islamic interpretation and promote peace through the collaboration of Islamic scholars through Africa. His life's work is the development of health, sustainable, and model Islamic community life. Thank you. Mohammed Milanzi. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidi al-Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin al-Fatih ila ma'ghulik wa al-Khatim ila ma'sabaq nasir al-Haqib al-Haqib wa al-Hadi ila siratika al-Mustaqim wa ala alihi haqqa qadarihi wa maqdarihi al-Azim. وراضي الله تعالى عن أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته to the honorable convener of this illustrious conference professor Usman Khan to the respected chair of this panel مبارك شيوخ my esteemed fellow panelists scholars of the طريقة my brothers and sisters on the path and conference guest at large. We greet all of you with the greetings of Salam and thank you for the introduction and for the great honor of being part of this uh, conference. 
Today, I um, will be presenting on the flood in the south, the failure of the Tariqa Tijaniya in South Africa. As a Murid and Muqaddam of the Tariqa, I cannot and do not claim to be without bias, but I have sought to capture this history as objectively as possible. Um, as far as the methodology I used for the study, there's limited scholarly documentation on this topic, but I relied on a lot of the work of Susanna Mollins Literas, who has done excellent work on the ground on Tijaniya in Cape Town. I also reviewed writings of, uh, on Islam in general in South Africa. On my side, I conducted 24 formal interviews with the role players in the Tariqa and also relied on countless informal uh, conversations, personal recordings, notes, and recollections from my 16 years as a Tijani. Identity is very complex in South Africa, so I want to highlight uh, three terms that I used in my study, uh, which I think are important to understand. First, uh, Cape Malays are uh, the descendants of enslaved people from the Dutch East Indies, current day Indonesia, uh, brought to South Africa by Dutch colonists who mixed over time in the country with other groups and have developed a distinct culture. I note that this definition may be contested. Uh, secondly, this is another contested category, but uh, for our purposes, indigenous South Africans are uh, South Africans from black tribes that are considered native to South Africa. That is the Khoisan, Ndebele, Zulu, Bedi, Sutu, Tswana, Swazi, Venda, Tsonga, and Kosa. Third, in the, in the paper, I use the term Indian Malay, uh, which in this study includes individuals whose uh, heritage is primarily Indian, primarily Malay, and those whose heritage includes different mixtures of these. Next in the paper, I provide some context on the state of Islam in South Africa. Uh, excuse me. Uh, next in the paper, I provide some context in the state of Islam in South Africa and why the ground was so fertile for the failure to take hold here. Important to note is that Three waves of Muslims entered South Africa consisting of uh, enslaved people and political exiles from Dutch East Indies, present day Indonesia beginning in the 1600s. Secondly, indentured laborers and merchants from the Indian subcontinent beginning in the 1800s. Thirdly, beginning in 1994 after the fall of apartheid uh, were immigrants entering from around Africa and other parts of Muslim world. Currently, Islam remains a minority religion at approximately 1.9% Muslim and black Africans are the fastest growing group of Muslims in the country. I also speak briefly about the xenophobic violence the country has experienced in recent years, which has affected Muslim immigrants. Also in many parts of the world, South Africa is experiencing a rise uh, in, uh, in Salafis, uh, Salafi Wahhabi ideology. But at the same time, there has been a, a Sufi renaissance as sheikhs from around the world have been able to enter the country as it opened up after apartheid. Molins Literas writes about some Indian Malay South African Muslims whose families have lived in South Africa for several generations who have come to identify more with South Africa than their ancestral homelands and have been looking to connect more with African Islam. At the same time, my research has confirmed that many indigenous Muslims have been looking to other parts of Islamic uh, Africa for inspiration as they seek to Africanize, quote unquote, Islam for their own communities. I do note in the study that I don't want to overstate the importance of these trends as the vast majority of people come to the, the Tijaniya uh, do so for spiritual benefit that uh, they see in it. But these dynamics did prepare the ground for the coming of the Feda Tijaniya to South Africa, uh, to South African shores 30 years ago. So how did the Feda of Tijaniya arrive in South Africa? So the story begins in 1990 in our neighboring country of Namibia. There an Indian Malay, uh, Sheikh Anwar Bayat of South Africa 
met Rwandans Mukadam, uh, Mukadam Umar and Sidi Ali Ntahoheka, who had recently converted to Islam and taken the tariqa at the hand of uh, Sheikh Abu Bakar Mumvaneza, also from Rwanda, who was a Mukadam of Sheikh Hassan Sisi radiallahu anhu. Uh, Sheikh Anwar also took the tariqa and was given taqdim from Sheikh Abu Bakar. Uh, they moved to Senegal to increase their knowledge and to do khidma to Sheikh Hassan radiallahu anhu. Sheikh Anwar returned to South Africa in 1994, and the tariqa began spreading to his family and friends in the Indian Malay community in Cape Town. A few indigenous South Africans also took the tariqa in Cape Town at this time. In Senegal, Muqaddam Umar was also given taqdim, and in 1996 was sent to South Africa by Sheikh Hassan radiallahu anhu. In South Africa, he was advised that he could work for Islam more effectively in the Gauteng province, home of the economic hub of Johannesburg and the administrative capital of Pretoria, where indigenous Muslims were more numerous and organized. He began doing the our work there. Muslims were more uh, calling people to Islam and telling, uh, only telling about the, tari uh, the tariqa if asked. And the tariqa also began to spread in Gauteng, particularly among indigenous Muslims. Sheikh Abu Bakar would later also come to South Africa to help guide the community in Cape Town. After the fall of apartheid in 1994, Senegalese and Nigerian Tijanis began, also began immigrating to the country, but uh, they were not formally organized and had little intimate interaction with South Africans outside of those who married South African women. Uh, these would change as the various communities shared uh, uh, Sheikh Hassan, uh, Sheikh Hassan radiallahu ta'ala who would bring them together. When the early Murids arrived, uh, in, uh, when, when the early Murids invited Sheikh Hassan radiallahu anhu to South Africa, he told them they must first build him a house. At first they thought he meant a house to live in, but Sheikh Abu Bakr advised uh, them that he meant they should establish a zawiyah. The community wanted to establish the Zawiya in the nicest areas of Cape Town in order to honor uh, uh, the, the Sheikh. But Sheikh Abu Bakr stressed the importance of gathering in areas accessible to the impoverished masses of indigenous South Africans. So they settled on the township of Kukuletu for various reasons were forced to, busy, uh, to buy in section four, uh, which those I interviewed described as the most dangerous section of the township at the time. Rape and murder were common and the Murids would often hear and sometimes even witness shootings. Indigenous South African, Sheikh Ashraf Zansi, the current Imam of the Zawiya says, the impact of the Tariqa was physical and spiritual in Kukuletu. Uh, Sheikh Hassan's spiritual assistance has now transformed the section four in the best, uh, uh, into the best section of Kukuletu. Sheikh Rajalau Anhu eventually uh, came to South Africa to attend the UN World well Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg. He was only in the country for a week, but he managed to visit different places in Gauteng, Durban, and Cape Town. Highlights from uh, the Sheikh's visit uh, include meeting privately with the then President Tabombegi. He was gifted Atrejville Masjid for the Tijani community in Pretoria to use, and he also was welcomed by hundreds of celebrating non-Muslim South Africans when opening the Kukule to Zawiya, which he later called the best welcome he, he had ever received, according to one Muqaddam I interviewed. The following year, in 2003, Sheikh Hassan came back for a second longer visit. There were several highlights from this second trip that I discussed in the paper, including that he was pledged the building of a masjid for the people of Harangua in Gauteng. In the paper, I describe the impact that the Tariqa has had on improving the lives of the people of Harangua, even those who aren't Tijani, a pattern that is also seen in other townships where the Tijaniya has penetrated around the province, such as Atrejville, uh, Tembisa, and Soweto. In this trip, Sheikh Hassan Rajalau Anhu also introduced Sheikh Ibrahim Heba, affectionately known as Sheikh Bai, to the country. Uh, 
Uh, in 2003, the Tijani community in South Africa needed a scholar who could lead them in prayers in Ramadan and instruct them in Islam and the Tijaniya. And Sheikh Hassan told them that Sheikh Bai would be the most suitable person for that. Sheikh Bai is the great grandson of Sheikh Ibrahim radiallahu ta'ala anhu and the grandson of Sayyid Ali Sisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu through his mother Sayyidah Umm Kulthum radiallahu anha. The sister of Sheikh Hassan radiallahu anhu uh, he, he received Ijaza al Aliya in Sharia at Ad Ma'ahad al Ali Lit Dirasat al Buhuth al Islamiya in 1992. And he was also trained in and received Ijaza in several traditional Islamic sciences, including the Tariqa Tijaniya and the Ijaza in Quran by Sheikh Hassan Rajalaw Anhu. He serves as Imam of Masjid Tilawa in Nuakshot in Mauritania and has produced many Hufas from several countries, including uh, uh, South Africa. Sheikh Bai has spent the um, has spent the month of Ramadan in South Africa nearly every year since 2003, and has visited every province in the country except Limpopo. Some of the highlights of Sheikh Bai's trip include that he's given the shahada to countless people. He helped organize and unite the murids in the country, and has met with several kings and chiefs of South African tribes. Sheikh Bai is known for imparting lessons with a keen sense of humor. He often renders the poems of Sheikh Ibrahim Radelau Anhu in song form, followed by a passionate commentary focused on instilling love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The formal introduction, uh, the, the formal in, uh, instruction component of his lessons include teachings of the books as, as such as Jawahir al Rasail, Sheikh Ibrahim's uh, Ruhul Adab, and the book of fasting from Sahih al Bukhari during Ramadan as was done by Sheikh al-Islam, Sheikh Ibrahim, radiallahu anhu, among others. Sheikh Bai's main methodology is teaching by example, and I give several examples in, uh, uh, of that in the paper. Other major visits by Shuyukh to South Africa include Fadila to Sheikh Tijan Sise in 2012, Fadila to Sheikh Muhammad Mahi Sise in 2015, and Fadila to Sheikh Muhammad al-Hassan Ali Sise in 2018. They visited multiple places around the country and continued the work begun by Fadila to Sheikh Hassan Rajalawan. It should be noted that many other prominent and respected Faida Shuyukh, including Shuyukh from the family of Sheikh Ibrahim Rajalaw Tala Anhu, have also visited the country over the years. The above trips are highlighted due to the official and coordinated nature of the visits. In the words of Sheikh Abu Bakr, the coming of the Shuyukh to South Africa always marked growth of the Tijaniya Brotherhood. After, taking about, after talking about the Shuyukh's visit, I move in the paper to the practical ways that the Tariqa is experienced and expressed in South Africa. I detail various dynamics that are unique to South Africa, including racial and immigrant local uh, dynamics, which can be bumpy at times, but it's pretty much universally agreed by the Murids that the Tariqa practically exemplifies the non-racial, non-nationalistic basis of Islam. As Molin's Literas puts it, I also cover the sectarian dynamics such as the booklets that have been written sharply criticizing the Tariqa by the members of the Tabligh Jamaat, and as well in the, the inter-Tariqa dynamics such as the joint Mauluds, which serve to unify the Tariqas and educate the Muslim community about the Sa'uf. Next in the paper, I give a few selected Be'a stories as examples of the different ways Murids in South Africa have come into the Tariqa. One such interesting uh, story that I can highlight briefly now is uh, one young uh, now Muqaddama who left her previous Tariqa uh, when she was told that only one in a million Murids will ever achieve Ma'arifa and that the chances for her as a woman were even less. So when she found out that Ma'arifa in the Tariqa was accessible to women and young people, she eventually took Be'a. She took permission to begin the Tarbiya and confirmed her Ma'arifa all on the very same day when she was granted the word of the Tarbiya. The international connections that South Africans have, been, uh, have, made, um, uh, have made have also further entrenched the Tariqa here including visits to Senegal for Ziara and Mawlud and the historical 2007 conference in Morocco to which South Africa sent 18 delegates 
uh, the intermarriage between the Tijani communities in South Africa and Senegal, and um, online connections such as through uh, the South Africa-based Tijani Worldwide WhatsApp group run by Sheikh Fakhruddin Uwaisi, which connects Muqaddams and Murids from more than 40 countries further contribute to the entrenchment. The next section of the paper speaks about the women of the Feather in South Africa. Uh, women and particularly mothers in Cape Town were among the first Murids of the Tariqa. And from the beginning, women have opened their homes as the first Zawiyas, as well as opening their kitchens and opening their wallets. There are a few known Muqaddamas who along with other female Murids have been active in the, uh, in the teaching and in the Islamic development of new converts or reverts and Murids. Women have also been active on leadership structures, particularly in Gauteng. Some of the local women interviewees also expressed appreciation for the example of female luminaries in the Tariqa, such as the daughters of Sheikh Ibrahim Rajilao Tala Anhu. There are a number of organizations and zawiyas around the country that service communities in various provinces, uh, provinces which organize the hosting of the shuyukh and execute events. Leadership is decentralized on a national level. One of the challenges faced by the organizations and zawiyas uh, is that the duties and responsibilities are often only shouldered by a few. Among the challenges uh, most often cited uh, during the interviews where the disunity and a lack of cooperation, both locally and nationally, too many scattered wazifa gatherings rather than meeting centrally, the need to cultivate more indigenous black leadership within the Tariqa, increasing Islamic education of local leadership of the Tariqa, the steadfastness of the murids, the muqaddam seeking to set themselves up as sheikhs, the rise in Salafism and secularism in the country, and attrition rates of the Janis who felt that they had outgrown the need for a sheikh or they just left Islam altogether. However, there are hopeful signs for the future of the Feda in South Africa. Interviewees pointed out many positive developments such as the number of young people entering the Tariqa and the Islamic and secular educational strides made by those young people. I highlight one young Murid who took the Tariqa while in high school, who was inspired by the sheikhs of the Tariqa to study Islam and Arabic, and now works as a translator in the Johannesburg Central Magistrate Court. He says his life has taken a completely different course due to the Tariqa. Then there are 13 Hufas from the South African community that have so far been produced by Sheikh Baiz Madrasa in Mauritania. Even older Murids have been noted to be increasing in their knowledge of Islam and the Tariqa. Through, um, uh, though it was also noted that this still needs to increase, especially among the Muqaddams. In conclusion, the failure of the Tariqa Tijaniya in South Africa, while still in some ways in its infancy, has come a long way in the past 30 years. In just three decades, the flood has become entrenched in the country while there are many challenges that remain, those on the path see great potential ahead. The most powerful instrument for the future growth may be the Tijani weird itself, seeking forgiveness through istighfar, sending salutations on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and remembering Allah through the Kalima. These basic tenets, along with the Ma'arifa, have the potential not only to continue to grow and elevate the tariqa in South Africa, but to transform the country as a whole. In the words of Muqaddam Ashraf Zanzi, the freedom of our people in South Africa, uh, in the freedom of our people in South Africa uh, think they have achieved is not the real freedom. Kalima is the real freedom. We can never be happy as Tijanis if our people Two don't have freedom. left us, please. Shukran, jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, thank you, and congratulations for the, this interesting communication. Without transition, I leave the place to Amadou Konate, whose paper is entitled Grace Extended, Baraka Boys and Young Muslim Spiritual Practice, Practice Online. 
Muhammad Konate, Amadou Konate, the, Mus the Muslim chaplain at Boston College. He received a bachelor's degree in African study and African American study from that mouth college in May 2019. He's currently a master of theological studies candidate at Harvard Divinity School, concentrating in Islamic studies. He is interested in young Muslim spiritual practice, philosophy, and Islamic intellectual history. Amadou. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah, Masriya Sidna Hongi, Fatri Maulika, Khatim Masuak, and Asra Kra, Radi Rasra to Mustaki Malari, Khadim of Lairadi. Thank you so much. I, I'm so grateful for Professor Khan for convening this and for affording me an opportunity to share and to, to speak. And there are so many people here who are my mentors and who are people that I admire greatly. So I'm, I'm very much shy and feel really embarrassed to even be sharing a space with you all, but um, um, thank you. Um, my topic of my paper, please excuse me, I'm dealing with a cold and I've been struggling. Um, and please let me know if you, if, I'm, if you have trouble hearing me. Um, the topic of my paper, my, my paper has changed significantly since, since the, I first shared, sh shared it. Um, there have been recent developments, um, but the, the, by the title, you would see that I titled it Grace Extended. And I'm, I'm thinking about this, this notion of grace extended because the faith that has been, as has been mentioned earlier, um, as Sheikh Ibrahim noted that it will spread up, um, far, far to the horizons. And so I am looking at a particular horizon and what that horizon is, is the horizon of the digital space. <laughs> and what does it look like for, for, for water to meet, um, um, like, I mean, to meet the, the, digital, the digital web and um, what, what, is that, what does that look like? And so I, I look at the works on the historical development of community of, 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 of grace, the faith of Tijania, and I and I note that they illustrate the uh, the dynamism of the of the of the tariqa, that although situated in a particular locale, that the, the tariqa is dynamic, that in, 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 in due to its capacity to be able to remake itself and refashion itself in the different um, locales that it that it manifests and the different streams that 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 this flood expands. Um, and enters, and so I, this, the Baraka voice for me is just a contemporary iteration of this dynamism. Um, and so, as a case study, what I hope to do is to showcase a context and site of manifestation of the faith that I that I feel has has hitherto, um, you know, been comprehensively ad addressed and looked at and assessed. And and it's particularly noteworthy that for the faith of Tijania as a youthful. Um, phenomenon which has been noted already uh, an historically youthful movement that uh, Sheikh Ibrahim himself was only 29 years old when he announced the Faida uh, and so it's we and so naturally the Faida is in, in its in its self-image as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a global phenomenon is going to be have to contend with with you know where young people are, and so what I what I what I what I know, especially in the West, is that young people are online, and young people are digital natives. And so wherever that where the faith is going to spread, it's going to spread online, and it's going to meet young people where they are. But when it meets young people where they are, <coughs> excuse me, when it meets young people where they are, what's going to happen? Will young people acquiesce to the demands and the principles and the structures of the faith, or is it that the are they going to challenge the faith to do so? And and what I what I ultimately conclude is that when when the faith that becomes situated in the cyberspace in this new locale is that it ushers in this cyber spirituality, which is something that has been noted by others before, that results in in, in contradictory conclusions from those articulated by Sheikh Ibrahim Nias regarding the principal components of of spiritual pedagogy and especially the emphasis that is placed on adab, because you know what what is adab and. Uh, and that, that is something that I, that I, that, I, that I hope that you that you will keep in mind. But just to give a general background of my of, of my, my my paper, it is uh, because I'm looking at cyberspace. It's it's within a broader discourse of digital Islam, and or digital religions, and then digital Islam of uh, more specifically, and even more specific than that is just cyber Sufism itself, which is something that was recently coined by Robert Rosenhall in his recent book on cyber Sufis. And he looks at Sufism online 
and he looks at the ways that that although historically Sufism has been an interpersonal relationship between murid and sheikh, within sheikh and murid, and that when it when it when it manifests in the, in the digital space, that it overturns many of those um, many of those of, the, of those of those of those structures, and it undermines a lot of those structures. And so my paper. <coughs> Uh, uh, Rosenhall looks specifically at the in Inayati order in America, which is the oldest Sufi order in, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. Um, and, and, he, and he presents, he, and he, he illustrates that, that, um, that when, when, when Sufis adopt um, technology and the tools of technology, and when Sufis manifest in the digital space, at least with the example of the Inayati order, that positive results are brought about. And so I wanted to look at a particular example of young Muslims and like what young Muslims are doing in terms of their own spiritual practices online. And then by virtue of looking at the case study of Baraka boys, we will then be able to understand how the faith that is contending with, uh, with, this new, with this new locale, with this new domain that it is uh, it, it had yet to, to, um, to, to, to emerge in and to manifest in. Uh, and what I, uh, just to, to, to set the, 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 the general background is that that um, the the I want to I want to first map the discourse of young Muslim spiritual practice online, and I and for me the the, the what I, what I have found in my research is that well firstly works on young Muslims young young works that focus on young Muslims primarily focus on their political activity or they look at you know, the stereotypical motifs of young Muslims identity conflicts, meaning, you know, how is it that young Muslims are reconciling their, their Muslimness with their so-called, you know, Western identities. But what I wanted to look at instead is how is young Muslim spiritual expressions and argue that in looking at their spiritual expressions, we can also, we will also find um, political activity there because there's a convergence of the spiritual and the political. Uh, and that's ultimately the direction of my paper that I want you all to, to focus on is that when this convergence between the spiritual and the and, and the political. And so what I what I what I had gathered about mapping young Muslim spiritual ex expression online is that young Muslims they find themselves in a really profound like um, scenario. And that although there have been several attempts um, to understand the avenues and characteristics of young Muslim spiritual practice, like we will gain insights, significant insights into the political pathologies, but ultimately like primarily, uh, which for which they increasingly are seeking spiritual antidotes and spiritual remedies is what I'm saying. I'm saying that um, young Muslims find themselves in a space Right in a context in the West where they are left unsettled by economic strife, they are left unsettled by civil unrest, as we have seen recently, especially in the U.S. They have left um, unsettled by ecological disaster, and they are also left um, disconcerted by a global pandemic and the COVID COVID um, nineteen virus. So all these factors become emblematic of their of, of their generation. And so additionally, we also have the ubiquitousness of late stage capitalism, which seems to grip all aspects of their lives and produces a type of psychology of despair and hopelessness. And that I believe can only be overturned by a radical hopefulness that can be that is that is only born from a deep faith and a deep spiritual cultivation. Um, and so unlike historical institutionalized channels and spaces for seeking those that spiritual remedy, young, young people are deciding to stay home. And by home, I mean online because they're digital natives and this is where they were raised. And this is, this is where they, they find home. But these young, these, young, these young, young, young Muslims in the West, by the West, I mean just Western Europe and, and, and the US and by West, I mean that in quotes, uh, find themselves in a context in the background of growing disillusionment with religion that other young people have in the West, right? For example, there's a, there's a um, that, that between 2009 and 2019, the number of non-affiliates to, to religion increased nine, nine percentage points. And the Pew Research showed that only 22% of young people 
like 22 percent of young people you know did not affiliate with religion or you know those who those who affiliated with religion said that they had particular qualms with it because of their own political convictions and so there's always this, this undertone of <coughs> please excuse me there's always this undertone of politics that is driving even their 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 spiritual commitments and their spiritual expression and and so that is the background in which young muslims are 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 are, are up against and so now what happens is that despite the decrease in religious affiliation that most young people online it they still have claims to spirituality and spiritual belonging but however this spiritual belonging is untethered to any type of um you know spiritual communities right it's a free-flowing spirituality that it's a more secularized spirituality um it's an untethered spirituality of young people that is perhaps you know understood as you know secular spiritual secularly spiritual um that does not acquire any attachment to any religious community and uh you know they tend to prefer the the phrase of i'm spiritual not religious right so there's still spiritual expression whatever that looks like, right? And then you have that, and so you have young Muslims who are also sharing in that, who have a, who have a, you know, a disillusionment and a disheartening like relationship to, to tradition and even Islam itself. And so they are also in need of some type of spiritual connection because of the context that I, that I, that I painted for you, that I told you about in which they, they're, they are, they have, they have grown up. And so, but they are turning to, you know, similar things that 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 their non-Muslim counterparts, non-affiliating counterparts are turning to, like, you know, psychedelics or uh, simply gathering with community and finding some type of spiritual connection there as a form of spiritual expression. Uh, but, however, there's also young Muslims who are expressing um, spirituality online in a manner that is very much uh, you know connected to or very similar to tr traditional expressions of, of spirituality as has been noted earlier before um, the, in performance of molid and, and, and these things and doing dhikr and all these traditional practices and my research surveys young muslim sp um, spiritual practices across these different social media platforms, but specifically on the app called Clubhouse, which was a, a, an app that was recently developed during the COVID-19 crisis uh, pandemic um, as a way to alleviate like the loneliness ep epidemic um, that, young Muslim, that young people felt. And Clubhouse is interesting because unlike these other apps, Clubhouse is simply like an audio only, an audio based app. And in my view, due to the centrality, the centrality of orality within the Islamic tradition, I think Clubhouse becomes a fitting site for spiritual practice and community building amongst young people. And some of the events and chat rooms that were hosted on Clubhouse to cultivate spirituality by young, by young Muslims that I that I found included, you know, such as the, you know, the title of spiritual practical spiritualities, soulful advice, or another one was idol breaking for idol or idol selling um another one was you know preparing preparing for ramadan for example how to connect with the quran or um you know reciting surah yasin surah mulk and doing the dhikr together or having a molid after party or having a you know a rumi's <coughs> rumi's poetry reading of rumi's um, ghazals um, these, so these are happening online. But however, I, I note particular characteristics of young Muslims' cyber spirituality, right? As in that it is democratized spirituality. So meaning participants want an opportunity to share their own opinions so that it's not, you know, there's nobody, no one really has a monopoly on who gets to speak. That's, that's something that is noteworthy. Another, another, another characteristic of it is that it is self-directed spirituality. So anybody can come up and just kind of, you know, just do their thing and set up a chat room. And, and another one is like, is another characteristic of it is that it's non-hierarchical spirituality, right? So ultimately no one is really above one another, right? And so I want you to keep this in mind is that this is what I have, um, gathered as characteristics of young muslim spiritual practice online spiritual expression online 
And then now keep that in mind in relation to what has been said already about the, dy the dynamic and the characteristics of traditional spirituality in within Tariqa, especially that of the Faith of Tijaniya. And lastly, another, another important um, characteristic of young Muslim spiritual practice online is that it's non-affiliating spirituality, that it does not uh, promote any affiliation to a sp particular spiritual path, or and it does not um, make it incumbent upon anybody to uphold a particular um, tariqa or or any other conditions of a tariqa and so on and so forth. And now, what is then what is then fascinating is that you have this, you have then the the the, the baraka boys for me who emerge as a fascinating case study because they offer like an alternative kind of spirituality to that of that that which is common amongst young Muslims. And so for them with the Baraka boys, they 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 emerge, right? They, despite belonging to the context of a growing dis, dis, um, disassociation from religion and disillusionment with religion and tradition, they 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 seem to uh, they seemingly have an uncompromising demonstration of spiritual practice that is rooted in Islam, like particularly Sufism, with affiliations to the Tariqa, with affiliations to the Faith of Tijaniya. And that, you know, the I want to just briefly share um, a bit about, so you can have a, a view of the, 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 the Baraka boys are. Another bit here. For the interest of time, I will just stop there. But um, I will share links, and people can can also see links in the in the paper. But <clears throat> so, what is interesting about the Baraka boys is that with their with their spiritual expression online, which is it's predominantly occurring online, specifically Instagram, is that with well, them, five more minutes, Amadou. Okay, thank you. But with with them, what is what is what is occurring is that they because they are rooted in in, in tariqa, is that Unlike those other young Muslim spiritual practices that are occurring online, they're instead saying, they're instead saying to, they're, they're instead demonstrating that that spirituality does not simply and solely occur online, and that as we saw in the first video, they're making ziara, they're going to ziara, and they're showing ziara online, and they're calling other young people to do ziara online, and. To, to 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 go be with the shiuk and young young people are seeing this and they're fascinating they're fascinated by 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 observing this by people who who look like them who dress that like them as one of the one of the members Mustafa Brick said like you know we wear this we wear nice clothing we look cool and yet we are hanging out with shiuk yet we're making these yara trips to the to the to the awliya and people are fascinated by this and so I I I found this to be particularly noteworthy um, and. The the ultimate reason is because as we think about the spread of the feda and the feda will need to contend with the different locales and how it's going to be forced to remake itself. But when the feda manifests online and it has and it contends with that space and that space already has particular qualities and characteristics and the particular characteristics that it has, especially when it has when especially in relation to to spiritual practices, is is one of 
democratization is one of non-affiliation. And so what is the what is the what is the tariqa going to do there? What is the tariqa going to how is the tariqa going to manifest online? And as as the Baraka boys are showing, is that when the faith manifests in the online space, right? It isn't to say that this 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 that the faith that cannot manifest online, but the faith that cannot seek to remain online. Right, the flood must 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 extend to the online space, but it must extend beyond the online space because water does not take root on with in electricity. It takes roots and ground, right? It must be an embodied practice because what happens in the online spaces, the online spaces, it's it's fragments, it's fragments individuals. Whereas traditionally, tariqa is about um, uh, this embodied practice is about making people whole. Right, it's about making people wholesome, and also one of the other dynamics and characteristics of this online space is that these online spaces are ones whereby people are segmented, and they gather together like around consumer habits and consumer practices, right? And particularly on Instagram is one where young Muslims and young people are encouraged to, towards extravagance and invincibility. They're taught to live their best lives. But what I'm saying is that. Well, spirituality and tariqa is not about living your best life. In fact, it's about death. <laughs> it's literally about the death of the ego. It's about the death of the self. And that is radically contradictory to all of the things that are being espoused in an online space. And so when the faith flows into that space, then it's going to be remarkable for us as we for us to, to, to look at because one one of one of one of the two is going to is going to acquiesce. And now Many people could say, well, am I advocating for the faith and not being online? Is this what, no, it's not necessarily that. What I'm saying is that, well, yeah, most people are online and it, it'll take away from accessibility, but these things were never meant to be wholly accessible to everybody anyway. And if they are, like Tariqa is all about conditions. You need to uphold certain conditions. And the number one condition is that you need to have an in, 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 in body practice. You need to have the, the sheikh, right? And and you know, there's 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 a verse that I, I close with um, that when is that you know that the abundance diverts you until you visit the graves. And so for me, I say that it's time for young Muslims to visit the graves. And the graves are the shuyukh, whose presence reminds us of the fragility of life and the world's feebleness, not what we find online spaces, which is just a calling towards the extravagance of life and the up upholding. Of, of life itself, rather than a reckoning with the fragility of life and a reckoning with death and the inevitab inevitability of death itself. And I think by, by, by the faith that is remaining uncompromising in that commitment to saying that, no, 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 we don't wanna uphold all these tools of technology, is that it becomes not only a spiritual expression, a spiritual act, but one, a radically political one as well. Because in the context in which we find ourselves is one that, now I look at the philosopher like Baudillard, he talks about the fact that we're living in a time of the hyper-reality. And by hyper-reality, what he means is that the, the simulation, the online spaces, these virtual spaces that we have, they become so interchangeable with quote unquote reality itself. And that so there is no, there's, there, it's, it's difficult to, to, to distinguish between um, the simulation and, and reality itself. And so we have now what has emerged is hyper-reality. And so what I say is that the, the future of the faith, right, is ultimately, right, is about a return, a tawba to reality. And reality is not going to be hyper-reality. As we have, as we unfortunately experienced yesterday with um, what, you know, forgive me for reminding all of us again, being bombarded in our online space, and I'm just closing here, please forgive me, and being bombarded by in our online space is difficult to, to, to close the door to have these sacred spaces, to have these spaces where only particular things, particular things could, could, could occur. But whereas traditionally with, with a scholar, when you have that intimate relationship with a scholar, he tells you, let's close the door and let's have this intimate knowledge that can, that can be realized. And that, that can only be, 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 be found beyond the screen in an embodied practice with the living living shiuk. And I think that that is, that is, that is the political activity in the spiritual expression mm -hmm of the faith to this day. So thank you again for the time. Please thank, you, so thank, thank you so thank you Amadou. I would like to congratulate our different panelists for this very interesting communication. Now without further delay, I open the floor to the public for interventions, comments or questions. Now the floor is open to the public. I have a question for Amadou. 
I'm going to do yeah. your interpretation of Hatta uh, Zursumul Makabir. Is it your own uh, interpretation or something that you borrowed from, from someone else? Oh, this is, uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, this is my own interpretation, but I, I, I'm, I, I perhaps it's coming from a place of conceit, but I, I'm sure someone else has already mentioned that about the shoe, so I don't want to claim that for myself, but this is something that I thought about when I, when I hear these phrases of live your best life, live your best life, which has become so, so championed, um, especially specifically on, on, on Instagram, but the tariqah is not about living your best life, tariqah is about giving your life. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, Milanzi, uh, if I could, if I may. Um, I know that if you could just speak a little bit to also the how Islam was introduced to, to South Africa and how that informs the way that the tariqah was picked up in South Africa. Um, was there correlation in terms of in, there's a correlation in, 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 in like the, the origins of, of Islam, like the, the, the way Islam emerged in South Africa and similarly the way that Tariqa Tijaniya emerged in, in South Africa? Okay, question from Muhammad Ilyas Imran. I would um, like to know your definition of spirituality. Okay. The question is addressed for Muhammad Milanzi. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, uh, shukran uh, for this uh, opportunity once again. Um, the, the way the Islam came in the country, uh, um, as you uh, correctly uh, put the, the correlation between the, the Fayda uh, or the coming of the Tariqa, uh, it's, um, it's not a, uh, what you call a, um, a correlation that I have um, uh, attempted to uh, explore in the paper, but uh, the, the first uh, Muslims that came uh, in, this, in the country, they were of course uh, people of Tasawuf. However, Tasawuf was not uh, a priority at the time because um, certain basic um, tenets of Islam needed to be prioritized. Uh, first, you, you learn the basics before you start talking about Ma'arifa and all the other um, uh, concepts that come with uh, the Sa'uf. So, but yes, um, with regards to the coming of the, of the Fayda, uh, the way I've uh, viewed it is, uh, and the way it unfolded, it's something that uh, there was no doubt that it was, uh, it was coming, it was predestined uh, uh, to come. Uh, with the way the the, the initial uh, practitioners took the 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 the, 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 the weird from the neighboring country um, and then bringing it into the in, into the country and then from there it entered to the community that was already practicing tasawuf particularly in Cape Town Cape Town was very fertile for that because Cape Town is um, is already a place where tasawuf is is much practice compared to the other uh, parts of the land. I, I don't know if this uh, addresses your, your, your question. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. We have one question from Gregory Rousseau. What are the reasons why some people leave the tariqa of Islam or Islam? What steps are being taken to address this? This question is, uh, address it to uh, Muhammad Milanzi again. What are the reasons mm -hmm. why some people leave the tariqa or Islam? Yes, um, uh, yes, I've highlighted on the people leaving the tariqa. There are there are a number of reasons. Um, and uh, so the, the ones that I've highlighted the most was um, sometimes people come into the tariqa and feel that uh, there's a whole misunderstanding about what the tariqa is about. Being a tariqa, uh, first and foremost, is to become a, 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 a murid. Uh, there is a saying among the, 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 the people of Sufi, they say, al-muridu la yuridu, that the disciple never 
desires. So whatever is being uh, instructed by the sheikh, that is what he will uh, uh, take and practice. But then some people, they want to sort of uh, enter into the tariqa and then after that, then see themselves as the uh, competitor to the sheikh. And then, uh, and then at the end of the day, then they end up uh, not being satisfied. And that in itself is an indication that the intention behind taking the tariqa was not necessarily about ma'arifa, but it was about the satisfaction of the self or the, the, the lower ego. And then there are other reasons why people leave the tariqa is that you have the, when people have been granted uh, taqdim or uh, being a muqaddam, and, um, and they don't, um, and, and, and because of the necessity of the time, um, that the, the, they don't uh, uh, to call, live up to the, uh, to, to, the uh, to, to the responsibility that the position requires, then there is a bad example uh, that is, is being learned or maybe there is no proper guidance. And especially in South Africa where the Shuyuk mainly, they are based in Senegal. So the, the, the distance is quite huge. So the, 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 the Muris are relying more on the Muqaddams. Now, when the Muqaddams don't live up to the, 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 the responsibility that they have been given, uh, that sort of also spoils the, the understanding of what the Tariqa is about. And then there's other reasons also that uh, um, <clears throat> in terms of the economics, uh, uh, some people enter into the tariqa because of uh, probably seeing that many other people who have practiced the tariqa, they are people who are well off to do. And then when they practice the tariqa and then they don't come in, they, they don't uh, achieve that, then, and then they, they feel that maybe something is wrong. So that's also a, a, a not so good uh, a reason why people join the tariqa in the first place. So those are some of the issues that we, uh, that we have. Now I have a message from Umar and address it to Amadou. He say, I was, all, I was wondering how the young people manage to connect with their spiritual presence in their online activities. Would you like to share some experiences? Question is from Umar to uh, Amadou. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I just saw an earlier question regarding my definition of spirituality. Um, well, this is a really fascinating question because especially for a lot of young people in the West, they tend to use the word spiritual and they say, I'm spiritual, not religious. But in my attempt to define it, I would say, well, the spirit is one that is the ruh in Arabic as, as, we, as you all know better than me. And so to be, to be spiritual then is to be of the spirit. And so to be spiritual means you need to know the nature of the spirit because it belongs to a particular domain and it has a particular... Um, proclivity and the proclivity of the spirit is one that it that it seeks to always immerse itself in the presence of its lord because that is what it knew before it came into this world in the primordial realm because god said to it am i not your lord and the spirit responded in ecstasy by saying bala by saying indeed and so to be spiritual is to continuously be able is to to be spiritual means to be responding to the call of your lord and that means to be immersing yourself in dhikr. That is my definition of like spirituality. And the further you go in that response to the call of your Lord is the, is the higher you increase in your spirituality. Um, and cyber spaces do allow for that because they allow for spirituality. But however, the ultimate, what it ultimately means to be, to, to be spiritual is to answer that call of your Lord, which is, which is to respond in this world as you did in the world before. And that can only be done in the presence of a sheikh. So you cannot attain spirituality without the presence of a sheikh. And so by also the question regarding giving your life, isn't giving your life, living your best life. Well, yeah, well, in the particular context, because it's only after death that you then live, because you live through Allah. And that is that is the only one who truly, that is true life, because Allah is at high. He's, he's, he's the one who is living itself. But in, our, in the context of online, in these consumer, imbued in consumerism, living your best life simply just means frivolity. And it means just acquiring more objects. And, you know, I'm looking at Baudrillard a lot and Baudrillard's system of objects is that people acquire these objects in order to affirm their, their, their selfhood, in order to, to make meaning and to make themselves. Whereas, whereas with in Tariqa, it's about relinquishment. It's about relinquishing these things from yourself so that the true self can, can, can emerge and the light of, 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 of the spirit can, 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 can burst forth. 
Now, regarding the question of uh, if spiritual practice, can young people, how do young people manage to connect with their spiritual presence in, in their online activities? Well, you know, I noted like they, 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 they have gatherings together, you know, like as, you know, as, uh, as the Dr. Yang has, has, has mentioned earlier, like they, they have these with the, with, with the, with the modelids that happened in Europe, you showcase that young people are doing things like that. That's a, and they're doing it online usually sometimes, or they have Instagram lives where they recite like the, the poetry of Sheikh Ibrahim Niyas as a type of spiritual practice. That's a, I think a beautiful spiritual practice, but I, I think of it only as like a teaser, right? It's only an invitation and it's only, it's not meant to, to remain there um, um, solely there. Thank you. So we have a, a question for Sheikh Ahmed Bukarnia. The question is from Alaji Dr. Pa. Which message ways do Tijani the people living in Europe should give to Europeans in the hostile environment created by attacks and so-called Islamophobia? Uh, thank you, Dr. Yang. I think uh, this Mogul uh, Tijani festival are a great occasion an opportunity for the Tijani disciples to spread the teachings of peace and tolerance uh, that they can derive from uh, the thought of Sheikh Ibrahim uh, because uh, um, in, during most of these festivals, there is a prayer move uh, made of a conference during which topics like tolerance, uh, peaceful cohabitation, uh, interfaith dialogues are being addressed by, 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 by speaking. And I think we, can, we have several examples with the, to, with the thought of Sheikh Ibrahim, his writings in, in many aspects of his life to show the true colors of Islam. Sheikh Ibrahim said during uh, uh, one of his speeches in Maulud 19, during the 60s, that the very core of Islam is peace because the main pillar of Islam, which is Salah, begins with Allahu Akbar means celebrating the unity of God and ends with Assalamu Alaikum. He said that the Muslims should oscillate between these two, celebrating Allah's unity and raging peace. He said this is the, 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 the main, this is the, uh, the thing that proves that Islam is the religion of, of peace. And uh, if you read his writing, like his last poetry collection, Serum Khalb, uh, Jim, while he was touring the world in 1963, he said, I am very weak, I am sick, and I'm, I'm, but I'm full of enthusiasm to uh, strengthen a religion that does not promote uh, fighting or violence for. Uh, the Hashimi prophet never waged war, but he repelled violence and, and the adversity. And I can give you many anecdotes, like when he met with Brezhnev, who was representing the, the Russian government at the opening of Winneba, uh, Kwame, Kuma, Kwame Kuma's ide ideological institute in Ghana, in Fe February 10th, 1961. Brezhnev asked Sheikh Ibrahim, how do you see the war with people of different faith and beliefs. How can we cope with, with each other? Sheikh Ibrahim told him that I see the world as a global village. We share the public arena. We have to do our best to make it peaceful and to live peacefully and to tolerate each other. When we leave out the public space and we go back to our privacy, our privacy is our, our, our religions and beliefs. That's how he saw the world. And he said, he narrated that Brezhnev stood up and hugged, 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 hugged him and said, at least we are brothers, we are brothers during, uh, during the days. And uh, even Dr., the late Dr. Suleiman Yang of Howard University, in the article, he entitled African Nationalism and uh, 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 Interreligious Relationship, and in, in Interreligious Relations, he highlighted the relation between Dr. Kwame Kurma, Ghanaian, Ghanaian president, and Sheikh Ibrahim Yassi said that this is the best example, living example, that Muslim and non-Muslims can live together, can be friends, can cooperate for the betterment 
and for the peace of the world. I think it, these are the, the type of messages that we, uh, Tijani or people from the FIDA should give uh, to the people of Europe. And then uh, there is a good start, but because I've attended uh, some of the these Maulid festivals and uh, during, uh, for most of it, local authorities are invited, mayors, councillors, or government government representatives. But all I can say about what I can say about the Dr. Paz question. Thank you. I have one more question for Sheikh Ahmed Bukar. The question is from Gregory Rousseau. He says, can you speak a little bit about the debate on the permissibility of peanuts for zakat? I know that this was a major theology. I beg your pardon? Yes, can, can we end soon the session? I have one more question, question for Sheikh Ahmed Bukhar Nyang. Question is from Gregory Rousseau. She says, can you speak a little bit about the debate on the permissibility of peanuts for the cut? I know that this was a major theological debate in Senegal around the time of by Sheikh Abdullah Nyas and also Sheikh Ibrahim Stein. I apologize that this disgrace a bit from today's topics. I did not have the chance to ask this yesterday. Here is the last question. This is not the topic of the panel I was given, but uh, the question was raised during the time of uh, Hajj Abdullah and uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Al Khalifa wrote an answer, even Sheikh Ahmed Sukairi, uh, if you read his book, Taj uh, Ru'us, he was addressing the question. And Sheikh Ibrahim also uh, wrote a book uh, entitled Ishad Sarin. Zakati Harim. Harim means uh, peanut. Sheikh Ibrahim, uh, he's a, he has a, there is a controversy, but his opinion is different from that of Sukiri. Um, he thinks that you cannot, you cannot give, you can give zakat from the oil, but not from the peanut itself. If my, if my memory is good, I think that was his position. Position was different from that of, uh, of, uh, of his, uh, of, of Sidi Ahmed Sukiri. But to, to, to read further, to go further about this, you can read uh, the Tajir Us, the travel of Sukeri to Sus, and the commentary made in the north by specialists of this question, Sidira Adi Gamu. Thank you. Thank you. So once again, I congratulate uh, the different speakers for these interesting communications. This panel was of high value with three interesting and complementary points of view. So thank you all and Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you very much all for excellent presentations. Mm -hmm.